Okay, without further ado, I will pass it over to Lauren Turner Dunn as she will greet you this evening. Hi everyone, good evening and thank you so much for joining today's session. Today's our leading edge conversations and it's gonna be a discussion with black business leaders re about resilience, innovation and opportunity. Um, tonight's conversation will be very impactful and insightful. As Nicole mentioned, my name is Lauren Turner Dunn and I have the privilege of serving as the co-VP of the Gracia Dio Black Students Association. And I would like to take this time to introduce you to tonight's moderator and our panelists. So we have our moderator, Karen Jackson. She serves as the executive director of recruitment for the Grazia Dio Business School. And our panelists include alumnus Quincy Newell. He received his MBA in 2012, and he is a founder and managing attorney at Newell law firm and he's the owner and of strategic and strategic advisor for 2114 it's a media production firm if our panelists want to wave they can do that also while i'm talking um also we have alumnus philip shepherd he received his mba in 2022 and he was a part of the president's key executive cohort pke147 and he is the chief executive officer of Specialist Media Group. He's a father, US Army veteran, public figure, and storyteller. Philip also starred in the TV show, The Specialist, and he appeared on my, one of my favorite shows, Survivor, on Paramount Plus and CBS. And we have alumni, alumna Britta Wilson. She received her executive MBA in 1992 and she got her doctorate in education in 2016. And she is a chief engagement strategist and former Pixar executive. Britta is a champion of authentic narratives and inclusion, inclusive cultures, and also an author and speaker. So as you can see, we have a stellar panel of alumni tonight, and I can't wait for you all to hear about their journeys to resilience and innovation. And I will now pass it on to Karen Jackson, our moderator. Thank you all. All right, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, as Lauren mentioned, we are going to have a conversation and we are so delighted that you could join us this evening um, for an engaging conversation featuring thought leaders discussing opportunity, resilience and innovation. And this is against the backdrop of business. Our speakers bring with them a wealth of knowledge and experience, offering insights that will undoubtedly inspire us to think outside the box and push boundaries in our own endeavors. So to begin the conversation, I would like to hear from each panelist their origin story. Um, how did you get into how did you get to this point in your career? and narrate and highlight the choices you made along the way. And Britta, I'm gonna start with you. Why, thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for this invitation to be here. I'm excited to talk to you all. And I'm also excited to hear from the other panelists, my origin story. So I was born and no, I won't do that. <laughs> so my career um, actually started at a small publishing company in the Hollywood Hills called Access Press. They produce, produce travel guides. I worked there right after UCLA. The interesting thing about Access Press was it was my fallback position. I graduated from college and didn't know what to do. I ended up getting this job at a publishing company. Um, lo and behold, the company was founded by a gentleman named Richard Werman. While you might not know Richard, I'm sure you know the company that he founded, and that company is TED. And so because of Richard's support and mentorship of me, I uh, ended up in an HR position and grew my career in the HR space. And in terms of um, how I got there, I, I'm asked this question often, and I would say, simply say that it's because of the favor someone had in me thinking that you know there was opportunities for me to pursue. Um, certainly me trying to figure things out and the why of things. I'd also say the opportunity to fingerprint has always been 
uh, fuel for my decisions in my career? Where can I have an impact in an organization? And then the last thing I would just say is just been fear. Like where where am I going to try something and do what I'm afraid? So I think those would be the way that would be the way that I would summarize my career today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I've never heard that term, the opportunity to fingerprint. I think that's a brilliant way to describe how you're making kind of an impact or a print in a in a new industry or even um, your current industry. Do you want to elaborate what made you kind of label it in that way before we move on? Sure. I think for me, when I look at opportunities, it's always about where can I have an impact? And I think of the impact is where I can put my fingerprints on something where that role or my contributions will outlive me and it becomes legacy. So that's how I describe the fingerprint. Love that. Love that. Okay, Quincy, let's hear your origin story. Uh, like Britta, um, you know, I was about to start off when I was born, but uh, it does have a lot to do with who I am. I'm from New Orleans originally. Um, and I was uh, blessed to be able to travel quite a bit with my family. So I, I was exposed to a lot of things. <clears throat> but career wise, I've been a landscaper uh, assistant. I've been a, you know, a bus boy. I've been a travel agent. You know, I've, I've, I've been pretty much, you know, uh, taking any job that I could. My philosophy was to say yes to opportunity as they arose opportunities as they arose. Um, I'm a fervent learner. I love learning. I love, you know, finding uh, new ways to do things. Uh, so every time uh, an opportunity showed itself, I leaned into it, you know, as a, as a way for me to gain new insight, new information, new skills. Um, and that's been, uh, you know, a, a way that I've operated throughout my career. So even in, you know, I'm an attorney now, but, you know, I was a um, entertainment executive, uh, general manager before. Um, I was a project manager in the entertainment business. I was a head of marketing in, in, in the entertainment business. Um, and all of those experiences actually gave me a full set of tools that I can use today, right? I not only uh, have you know worked inside organizations, but I've worked in every aspect for the most part of the organization. Um, and that has helped me to create a rounded or three kind of a 360, um, you know, uh, tool set that allowed me to navigate uh, all of my career opportunities in, in my later years. Um, so, you know, for me, uh, I always looked at, um, you know, my career path as, you know, what is, you know, first of all, I'm a God-fearing man, right? So what is God putting in my path? And who am I to say that this isn't for me, right? Let me explore this and let me get the uh, information that is being offered to me here and let me see how I can use that in my future. Uh, so I always, you know, pivoted. So my career has really been like this. It's never been a straight line. And I always tell, you know, younger folks, especially when I mentor, that, you know, sometimes you think you have this clear path to where you want to go and you believe it's going to go this way, but really your path could do this. As long as it's, you know, tracking upwards or forward, you're going in the right direction. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think it's always good to say yes and to try different things. So mm -hmm. let me ask you this. Sure. Um, you said that you were a landscaper. Now you are an attorney. Is there something mm -hmm. that you learned as a landscaper that you've been able to apply to your current field? Yes. I mean, you know, in my uh, role then, I was an assistant, right, to the owner of the landscaping company. I learned how to be a part of a team, take direction. Um, learn how to, to have resilience because you have, you know, resilience as, as part of the title, but you know, that's a, that's a tough job. It's a hard job to do. And I learned how to be, you know, be resilient throughout, throughout all of that, but also, um, you know, how to understand business, you know, honestly, um, cause at being assistant to the owner of the landscaping company, I was very close to the deals that were being made. And when they were being hired, I was the first person on site. Um, so I took advantage of, you know, that opportunity to gain as much information. A lot of folks might get into a job and they don't pay attention, right? They do the job and they leave. Uh, my philosophy is when I'm there, I want to survey the field that I'm at and figure out what are they doing? What are they doing over there? Let me go ask questions, right? Oh, if there's an opportunity for me to step up and be in a position of you know, leadership, well, can I do that? I'd, I'd love to do that. 
Uh, so that's really, you know, I, I guess it's kind of building uh, some muscles that would allow me to navigate uh, my future career. Yeah, that could be a book, like Landscaping and Honest Introspection <laughs> of Business. So mm -hmm. yeah, if we see that book, we know where that idea came from. <laughs> Thank you so much. Philip, I'd love to hear your origin story. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm one of uh, 12 brothers and sisters, and I'm also a twin, and there's two sets of twins in my family. And my father was a person in the Marine Corps for 26 years, and so we moved uh, around a lot, and particularly up and down the East Coast. And uh, we moved from where I was born in Philadelphia to Georgia, ultimately to a small town in upstate New York. But in each one of those places, it was a diff totally different environment. And I found myself having to learn new skills and adapt. So we moved from Atlanta, Georgia, to this small town where my family was the only African-American family in town. Um, I excelled in that environment in terms of playing sports. I was very active in the drama club. Uh, I stayed there until I was 15 years old. And then my twin and I had an opportunity to come to Southern California to visit, beg my parents to allow me to stay. And fortunately, I had older siblings. Uh, I'm seven and eight, so there was you know, a significant number of them older than me. And I had an opportunity to live here and experience Santa Monica and Los Angeles. And from that, attending Santa Monica High School, I went to junior college and I got exposed to first being a, uh, a lab person at a company where they made all the bathtubs and, and toilets and things like that, but they, they actually use clay to make it. And I tested all the materials. So that was a job I had. And then later I went into the military and because my father had also served during that time, they knew of him and gave me an opportunity to learn a particular set of skills. I had a top secret clearance working with computers. When I got out of the surface, uh, I was approached to be a special agent with uh, an agency, and I welcomed that opportunity. Uh, I got training in terms of how to interview, how to ask all types of questions to determine whether or not someone's being completely truthful and honest. Uh, and I did that at multiple agencies, ultimately at the State Department, and then had an opportunity to work for a technology company. And I came in initially uh, with no skills and had no experience in that area, but they had at that time in the early 90s, they would actually train you, they'd expose you to how to work on a telephone, how to do sales over the telephone, how to go out and do presentations and interface with senior executives at major corporations. And so from that experience, it transformed my life uh, every step of the way, as long as I was willing to work hard, learn what I needed to learn to excel in that environment, I found that I could I could do very well. And so what you've heard from the other panelists about being opportunistic in terms of being willing to accept opportunity uh, for me was also that as well as taking initiative when given an opportunity for a new territory expansion and then someone didn't want to go i'd raise my hand and you know and take on that opportunity uh, and throughout my whole life i was always an avid reader of new and interesting types of technologies and so i was able to Excel uh, run at the beginning of what we call the internet in 2000 and be part of a pre IPO situation with a company where I've been working and stable in one environment, but looking at this new opportunity, which meant I would make less money, be, but be able to earn a significant more in potential stock if the company went public, which it did. And uh, that transformed my life for me and my family, uh, you know, as a father. And I came to Southern California and again. And, and was able to purchase you know a home and and, and excel for for many 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 years but i've also exercised and taken very good care of myself and so was tapped by a reality tv show survivor to participate in two seasons of the show and from that experience while i'm in the middle of the game several ideas and concepts for stories came to me and so i was able to publish books uh, take full advantage of promoting those books while I was, uh, from my experience on the show, when the show was airing. And so that was a tremendous opportunity, you know, for me. And today with my uh, concept of specialist media group, I've been able to launch the whole idea behind taking one of my novels and potentially putting it on the metaverse, utilizing AI, Web 3.0, 
and a host a host of other technologies to do that. And so I believe you have to be resilient. You have to have the ability to, you know, take some knocks, but pick yourself up and make sure that you align yourself with people that can help you make your dreams come true. And so far I've been really blessed in that capacity. Mm -hmm. That's quite the, um, that's quite the origin story. So let me ask you this, what would you think is uh, more challenging navigating the business arena or some of the scenarios you were put in, in on survivor on the TV show? Survivor was, uh, was clearly not, you know, I would say for television purposes, you would say, you know, starving, losing 32 pounds, uh, being in an environment where people don't necessarily want you to win in life because they're trying to win. That's difficult. But learning the skill set required to exceed in business, where it's a highly hyper competitive environment, not only within the organization, but also externally, you've got to be willing to be constantly learning new new information, processing it properly, and leveraging that for your career as well as for the organization. And my experience at Pepperdine, for example, um, coming back in 2021 to get the PKE at Executive MBA, it was so transformative in terms of a process of looking as a startup and as well as for those of us who were you know, had been in organizations and wanted to look back and see it had what were the things that we did and why did we do them well and how can we leverage that going entrepreneurially going forward and that was what was key for me is that you can you're in a constantly building mode but survivor in comparison to the business is is it's it's not really a comparison mm -hmm. okay thank you this is a good time to pivot to professional resilience and in the fast paced and ever evolving professional landscape, it is crucial for leaders to exhibit resilient skills. Being resilient means having the mental toughness and adaptability to overcome challenges, setbacks, and adversities that inevitably arise in any business environment. So Quincy, I'm gonna start with you. I invite you to share time when you had to maintain your composure during a meeting, while speaking at an event, or even one-on-one -on -one with a colleague, what was the situation and why was it difficult to remain composed? Hmm. That's a that's an interesting question. Um, because I it it's it's a daily battle for me, um, being a black man in America, that I uh have to be faced with, you know challenges and adversity um, and have to develop the muscle to be able to navigate those situations, right? So, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, a lot of what we're talking about when, it you know, we're talking about resilience and, and how do you navigate within organizations has a lot to do with how you feel about yourself, um, how you look at yourself, how you value yourself, right? Because when you're sitting in those meetings, I've, I've been, you know, throughout my career, I've been the only person that looks like me in meetings. And, and it's, 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 a, it's a more constant thing than not. Um, and you have, you know, those scenarios where you're aware that you're being looked at and judged to some degree, right? To determine your level of competency, you know, how, you know, just generally how smart you are. Um, and you have to put all of that to the side. You cannot, in my, the way I approach it, is I don't listen to any external, you know, input that's coming at me, right? I have to operate from my internal kind of rudder. And I have, that means that I have to be prepared. That means that I have to make sure that, you know, as, as Philip was mentioning, that I, have the, the right information, the right knowledge, right? So I put the onus and responsibility on me, right? To be the best and show up the be as the best person that I can be in every situation. Now, an example, you know, for instance, um, you know, I've, I've co-founded a company called uh, Code Black Entertainment, all right? So we're an African-American focused distribution company production unit. We are, you know, started in 2001 um, and, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, started in uh, 2005 and ultimately Lionsgate purchased our catalog and we were, you know, um, there until I left in 2017. But in all those situations, we were an African-American focused unit 
that was being inserted in companies that didn't focus on our market, our consumer, um, and our product. So on a daily basis, we had to convince the, you know, the powers that be, of course, because we had to get approval for money, for budgets, you know, everything was needed approval. So we had to go in and convince our, you know, partners, if you will, that investing money in our company was a smart business move, right? So we would have to go in and <laughs> prove to them that we are a market, that we, you know, have to, we, you know the, the amount of money our market generates and how much we spend and disposable income and all of that. And instead of it being emotional, you know, like you just listen to us, we just decided to be excellent, right? To come in and be well-prepared, um, not be concerned about <clears throat> how they view us, what they think about the market, uh, but come in and be prepared and provide solid information that was irrefutable, right? And, and really kind of flip the table. So every time we were faced with that, our response to that was not anger, was not, you know, insult. It was how prepared are we, right? Are we showing up the way that we want to show up and that we believe is worthy of our, right, our business? Um, and uh, adopting that mindset for me got rid of a lot of the you know, the, the, the obstacles and fear and really just allowed us to walk in there with our heads up and our, you know, um, and our, I call it our chest out. Right. Um, and that is really the, the, the mindset and approach that I've always taken. I, you know, I, I think it's important for us to, to not be fearful. It's important to, for us to understand that we actually have value and worth, right. It's important for us to understand regardless of what anybody else thinks that if you're focused on your, your market as a, as a business segment, that it is viable, right? We always, you know, we were the ones that were pushing the idea that diversity is good business. And that was in 19, you know, 92, right? And, and we believe that, right? It wasn't a sales gimmick. It wasn't a pitch. It was like, yes, we believe that. And you have to tell me why it is not, not the other way around. <clears throat> so um, I guess it's just, you know, this mental fortitude, right? And confidence and belief in yourself, but that all again, starts within. You have to establish that and develop that yourself. And then when you establish that within yourself, there's nothing anybody can do to shake you. So I imagine that during that time, you were well-prepared, did your pitch, but maybe the outcome wasn't what you expected. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have when things don't work out, when you prepare and they should work out, but as we know, nothing's 100%, there's no perfection. Mm -hmm. Many times you can be very well prepared, sure. but still the decision doesn't go your way. What advice well, do you I, have? Well, I guess it's, you know, it's also your, your philosophy around what that means, right? I don't believe in, in failure, right? I don't believe in losing. <clears throat> so like what you're saying is, you know, what if you go in and, and that, that attempt did not work for you? Well, I'm assuming, you know, I'm a sports person, right? You have a complete season, you lose games. Right. It's it's expected. Right. So you should it should you should expect no's. Right. You shouldn't go in and expect yeses, which is why when you expect no's, it, it, your preparedness rises. Right. But when you go in and you didn't you don't achieve the outcome you were you're you're hoping for, I look at it as an opportunity to learn. Right. I go back and do a postmortem. I say, you know, I ask questions. So what was it that, you know, um, brought you to the no? What could we have done better? How could we have gotten you to a yes, right? And then take that information, go back and prepare again, and best believe we're coming back again for the yes, right? So right. I would say that, you know, a, a, a no is not a no. A no is a not right now, right? right? And when right. you walk away, you come back and you knock on that door again, right? Or, but you approach it differently, right? Maybe you run up to it instead mm -hmm. of walking up slow. You know, maybe you mm -hmm. come from the side, right? There's always ways to, um, you know, to overcome obstacles. You just have to look for them and search for them. Oftentimes when we find, or we, we get faced with no's, we believe that is a no forever. The answer is no, that's not that's true, right. right? It is a no for right. today, right? That's so right. If, you, if, you, if you adopt that logic and our philosophy, then there is no losing. Mm -hmm. It's just time. When is my time, right? 
That's right. Yeah, many times no really means I need more information. That's why postmortem is so mm -hmm. important in business mm -hmm. to kind of reevaluate. Yeah. Um, thank you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Britta, how would you answer that question? Share time when you had to maintain your composure in various scenarios. Absolutely agree with Quincy. It's it, it's a Tuesday. It's Monday. It's every day that you can come up with an example of those types of scenarios. So it's whether I'm sitting, I've been sitting in a meeting and someone makes a comment after I've made a contribution and said, oh, wow, you're so articulate as a black girl. And I'm a wholly owned woman, but I'm now a black girl in this meeting. Um, or it's whatever microaggression you face in the moment. I think, you know, I like the way that you defined um, resilience, because I think what it does is it captures the mental toughness that's required. But what I think that's really important there that's worthy of a double click is that that's discipline and that's intentionality, right? Because I think it's important for us to choose, to Quincy's point, around how we want to respond. How do we want to bounce back? How do we see that opportunity? And I think so many times when you are the lonely only in the room, when you're the only person um, that has you know melanin in their skin that's sitting in the C-suite, it's about choice. You can't double click on every time there is an offense or every time there's a no or every time there's a speed bump. You really have to be intentional about where you want to spend that energy and where you want to spend, at least for me, that bounce back. How do I address this in a way that's most productive for me? I think, though, that the leading factor in that cost of intentionality, though, is how do we protect our well-being in that? Because I think particularly as people of color in the workplace, as I described a moment ago with the constant onslaught of you're this for that, I'm surprised by this about you, is that we have to be very smart about how much investment we want to make in that intention, in our choice to respond, in our choice to um, address a situation in the moment. But again, I, there's endless examples of where, you know, we're faced with things that require the mental toughness or the fortitude, and we have to choose how we want to respond with intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as an African-American woman, it can be even more challenging. We have to, in different ways, um, have yes. resilience in various scenarios. Um, can you speak to that, you know, how you think it's different for African-American women versus African-American men? Well, I think right off the bat, you have the stereotype of the angry Black woman. So anytime that you're sitting in a meeting, you're consciously aware oftentimes of just your, your facial effect, right? I could be processing something very intently. And, you know, if my brow is furled, doesn't necessarily mean that I'm angry. It just means that I'm trying to do the calculus of what someone is saying to me. But because that's been such a predominant theme in the workplace or predominant stereotype in the workplace, the level of consciousness of that is significant. And so the counterpoint for me is always to be thinking about, you know, fix my face. How am I looking? What are the images that I'm projecting? That's less about resilience and more just about awareness of what the speed bumps are from a stereotype perspective in the workplace. That's right. That is exactly right. Thank you. And Philip, how would you answer that question? Um, <clears throat> Loved all the responses uh, from the other uh, panelists. In my own career, I want to take it back um, a notch to actually engagement in, um, I sold what were called enterprise-wide solutions to the Fortune 1000 type companies. And there would be situations where I would have wonderful conversations with uh, the, the company that I was calling on, with, calling on with different executives. And because of the way I speak, they couldn't tell what color I was. And then I would uh, typically fly in two consultants with me for this business call that we're gonna have in person now. And myself, and I generally got there about 15 minutes earlier or 20 minutes earlier before my team did to get the room set up and things like that. And so um, I'd be in the lobby and I'd be the only person sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a lobby of a company. And the person that I'd called on would come down and go to the receptionist and look around the room and then go back up because they'd been told that I was the, you know, there was someone there for them to see and they just couldn't compute in their mind that it was a black person. And then they'd call him again and say, well, he's still here and then come down. And then, then I'd say, are you looking for Philip Shepard? I'm, I'm Philip Shepard. And I could see on their face immediately, you know, that they were not expecting me. And 
in some instances, it really took a lot of uh, fortitude on my part to move forward that meeting because I knew I was going to potentially have an uphill you know, situation in that meeting because of the way they were perceiving me. Um, but what I would do in those situations was to always be so well prepared and already had covered so much ground before ever going on that call or going in person, understanding what the business requirement was, what was the arching reason why they were potentially making this decision to spend millions of dollars for what they're about to do so that it didn't by the by the groundwork that I did before I went into these companies and talking to lots of different people in the company it made it so that yeah you might not like my color but for the information and the, that I provided to you and the research that I did on your organization and the understanding and the clarity and the people that I brought to this party to help you solve a pervasive business problem um, it doesn't matter and I've approached everything in my life that way to 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 uh, to be well prepared, to have fortitude that I'm not leaving until I get what I came for. When I became a federal agent at the State Department, they had 67 men. This is in the 80s that did what I did. They had no women of color. There were no Spanish people. There were just all white males in that environment predominantly at that time. And I remember when I came into the interview, uh, the three men who were interviewing me, senior white men, um, had told me, you know, thank you for coming in. You scored a 99 on the test, but the other two occupants, I mean, uh, occup you know, I, uh, not occupants, but uh, people who had applied for the for the test mm -hmm. had yeah, scored 100. Yeah. Yes. But again, information is power. And I asked them to has there anyone in here of the two applicants that you're considering for this position served in the United States military? And he said, no, they, they have not. I said, well, then, then you're aware of under section, at the time I can't quote the law, section 103 of the executive order under Eisenhower, that if a veteran comes in and applies for this position, he doesn't have to score the highest. He ought to get 30 points and he, he gets the job. And that's how I got that first uh, rather that second job at the State Department as a special agent. But again, I wasn't I wasn't going to kick the door in. I didn't lose my composure. I just stated factual information and and I was able to you know get that opportunity at, at that time. So I think it's paramount that you uh, you be well prepared, you know what you want in life and and you need to be prepared to go and fight for it. Uh, the other example I will give for you would be, after I had been on Survivor and a number of years had gone by and George Floyd was murdered by that police officer, I was contacted by a number of former contestants who were African-American who felt that they had been wrong in terms of the editing process, in terms of the treatment they had gotten from the television show. And I was asked to participate and form an organization called the Black Survivor Alliance. And we had an opportunity to meet with the senior executives of CBS, uh, including the president, as well as the host of the reality show. And a year later, you heard it announced that there were no longer going to be shows where they only had two African-Americans competing in a game with 18 other Caucasians who would typically eject their, those people out of the game immediately. They now do what they call 50-50 and, and persons of color. And, but the point I'm making is that in that meetings that we had with them, there were times when things that were said that it was it was so focused on what I needed to say and what I needed to communicate that I could not allow my emotions to come up so that it would diffuse as the angry black man, you know, uh, to get what we came there for, which was we wanted 50, 50% representation. And we were able to achieve that with, with them. And um, to CBS's credit, I would say that they, they heard what we had to say and they instituted those changes and I actually think they have a, a better show because of it. So those would be the two examples I have for you. Yeah, and I'm gonna continue with you um, into the next question because a common theme between the three of you is being prepared. Preparedness can help you in regards to resiliency. But what, what um, I'd like to ask is how can you develop mental toughness? It's something that is necessary in business. So how can you develop mental toughness, flexibility, 
and emotional strength to thrive in an adverse work environment? Well, for me, I always had, uh, when I did very well in jobs and I was making lots of money because I had a family support, I always acted like I still needed to pay the rent at the, on the following Monday. I never, I got com sometimes commission checks that were $40,000, $50,000, okay? I never rested on my heels in that situation because I knew that uh, potentially I could be replaced. Uh, there was jealousy, petty things that happened in the corporation. So the mental toughness for me was about knowing what I wanted Quincy said it earlier, you know, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted to achieve. And I knew that the best way to, to do that would be, you know, be able to take some lumps, being able to take a few hits, learn from your mistakes. I, uh, if I could pan around in my office right now, you'd see I have all kinds of books about uh, self-help, um, being focused, learning to have a, a, a a quieter, still nature at times when you're faced with a situation. Think before you speak in certain situations. And um, adversity is a beautiful thing because you, it will it will show you know who you are and what you are. Um, and even though you will, may have some setbacks, you can still focus. You can you can uh, you can learn and and you can grow. And so the mental toughness part comes with. If you don't have mental toughness, you're easily, you know, you're wearing your emotions on your sleeve. You're, you're easily manipulated. You're easily uh, going to fail in life and not only in work. So mental toughness is something you have to focus on. You can acquire the knowledge. You can go to seminars. And in some respects, uh, in our strategy class at Pepperdine's PKE, we had a... Uh, the professor brought in an individual who taught us about meditations and how you can do certain types of breathing exercises that help you relax and stay focused. And believe it or not, it came in handy even in amongst ourselves with the cohorts. Um, so yeah, I, I would say yeah. you, you've got to get that material and learn for yourself. Yeah, yes, I agree. That's great. Britta, um... How have you developed mental toughness and flexibility and emotional strength? I think all the answers that you've heard so far have been incredible and I think completely spot on. I think just having a balanced perspective of who you are and what the opportunity is and what the contributions can be is important. I think oftentimes, um, you know, if we are if we are tossed and turned by whatever fad, whatever decision, whatever change happens, we lose ourselves in that. And so I think having a balanced perspective about who we are, where we are, what the opportunity is, I think that's really important. My grandmother used to always say that you don't have to consume everything that's served to you. And I think that's really important around your mental, because that protects yourself. And I think that when we think about mental toughness and fortitude, as I was saying early, you know, your response is, it has to be intentional. And I think that that intention has to be about protecting your well-being. And so part of that mental toughness is not only preparation and having a balanced perspective, but also protecting your own well-being. What are some of the things that you do to protect your well-being? Uh, Philip said it, I recently started meditating. I find quiet space. Um, I am a woman of faith, and so I will find my solitude in the Bible and in the word and in my faith, but just taking time out to recalibrate and not consume everything and not believe everything and not, not allow everything that someone has said to me to impact who I am, because I know who I am, has really been helpful for me personally. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And Quincy, can I, can how I... have you... Oh, yes. I'm sorry, it's Philip. I had one other thing I wanted to add that came to me and I thought about it earlier and I meant to say it with, with this question. And so I, if Quincy doesn't mind, I'd like to say it here. So it's, it's timely. When I was 19 years old, I was given a quote, Chinese quote, and it goes like this. The responses of human beings vary greatly under dangerous circumstances. 
Strong men advance boldly. Weak men grow agitated. But superior men stand up to fate and endure resolutely in their inner certainty and bide their time to more favorable odds. And that's that's been a personal key for me, a recurring theme. It's always there. So that's how I built my my strength. Mm, thank you. That's that good. was a mic drop moment. I don't even know. Yeah. If you... <laughs> that <laughs> was really hot. I like that. I love that. Um, I, I think, well, you know, what Philip said is spot on, right? Um, but Britta mentioned something at the end, and that is knowledge of self, right? It's important to know yourself. I right? guess if you don't, then people are going to, you know, play you uh, left and right all the time, right? But if you understand yourself, then you know what you are willing to do or not do. Um, you know, it's like, um, you know, how do we uh, obtain our our agency in all situations? Because remember, we live in a, you know, a world where, you know, it's all free will, right? No one's forcing us to do anything. So everything you do is a choice. So you have to determine, or at least the way I look at it, you have to determine what you are willing to accept, right? If you accept something that you, you know, if you take something that you don't want, and then you complain about it, well, that's your choice. You've done that, right? So it's understanding that that specific point. Now, you know, we all have to make a living. We all have to make money. You know, we all have to do that. You know, that's, that's you know, uh, completely understood. But once you, you know, get a sense of yourself, right, where you have, an, you have an understanding of who you are, the value of yourself, then your decision-making is different, right? I mentioned earlier on, so when I was younger, I used to say, yes, I'm at a stage now where I'm, fine saying no to things I don't want to accept and I don't want to ha have to deal with or um, even in even in you know uh, meetings or um, you know in uh, business interactions you know I'm more comfortable speaking my mind um, because I understand I'm willing to, to, to suffer whatever those consequences are because I've made that decision for myself right so I'm willing to do that now how do you build mental toughness you know it's you know it's for me, it's, 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 a, it's work. It's not something you just, it just appears, right? You can't just read a book and do it. Um, it's like going to the gym. You have to exercise it. You have to deploy it. You have to, you know, put it into action on a regular basis. And the more you do something like, you know, if it's, um, you know, the, the mental toughness aspect is like could apply differently to other, uh, to every individual person. But, you know, if there's something that you're challenged with, right, it could be simple, simple as, speaking in front of people. Your job is to speak in front of people, right? To push yourself, force yourself to be uncomfortable. Just like going to the gym, the first time you try to put up two plates, you're about to die, right? But if you do it enough, your muscle tears, you build some muscle on top of that, you get a little bit of strength. And after, a, after some time, you'll be putting up those two plates regularly, right? It's no different with your emotional you know, um, growth and your mental toughness right because that is a process so i think you know a lot of folks might not not approach it that way they look at mental toughness as this concept that might just appear but they're not actually putting in the work to achieve mental toughness over time it's not you know some people are born in some certain ways that are just you know fearless and you know and other people that are you know might have had some trauma right so everybody's different but if you all you know if everyone just starts to walk that path in time, just like putting one foot in front of the, of the other, in time, you will realize that you are tougher, more resilient than you were last month, right? And, and it's a practice and you have to do this. Another thing um, is remembering that everyone's human. We're dealing with human beings, right? Even when you're dealing with, you know, things that might have, you know, bias and prejudice, that person sitting on the other side of you or, you know, on the outs, on, you know, in front of you, they're also a human being with their own trauma, with their own whatever, right? So everything isn't about you always. It's about them. You know, I was, um, you know, a mentor of mine told me something that was, you know, transformative for me anyway. Um, they said that the per a person's reaction to you has nothing to do with you, has everything to do with them. You might trigger something for them. You might, you know, push a button for them. Like, you know, it could be biased. It could be a, a variety of things. But remember, it is not you. 
right? What we often do, I think, is when we have reactions or external, you know, reactions to us or, or input that's coming from others, we internalize it and make it about us. We say, oh, this, you know, this person, what am I doing? And it's like, no, 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 don't do that. Because if you, foot number one, have knowledge of self, you understand who you are, you understand your value, you can be objective in why that response is coming your way because it's un, unwarranted. You know, that's not who I am. They, they don't know me, right? So if you have that, you know, that, that, that kind of mindset and you exercise that over time, what you'll realize is you start to be able to dominate a room. You start to be able to, ex, ex, you know, kind of uh, express energy that shifts other people's energy, right? And that is simply by being, you know, uh, we talked about confidence and, you know, being prepared. Those are other pieces, but all of those things together, you're powerful. When we talk about black excellence, right? We talk about, um, you know, um, how we always have, how we have to show up as kings and queens. That's just my my vernacular, so you know, apologize, right? Um, but that is true. I believe that wholeheartedly, right? So when I walk into a space, you're dealing with a king, in my mind, right? And I believe that I operate that way and I think that way. So therefore, whenever I'm engaging with you, I am not concerned with how you feel i'm not concerned like at least about me i'm not concerned with what you think what i'm concerned with is what the task at hand what are we dealing with right now how do we get this to this place that we're trying to get it to right and then again if it doesn't come turn out the way that you want then you take that don't personalize it you go back and watch tape get the information you know how do we how do we address the situation are you the right person you might not even be the right person i'm giving you way too much power who's the person above you who do we need to talk to Right. And that's just a, 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 think, a way of thinking and a philosophy that you can adopt for yourself. But it all starts with you. Again, I think everything we talk about, resilience, mental toughness, everything is really about how you deal with yourself, not how you extract something from someone else, because they don't have the answers for you. You have the answer mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. That's my excellent. That's my. Yeah. Role soapbox <laughs> i love it i love it very good well in the remaining time that we have left we are going to pivot to the last um topic and that's innovation so innovation tactics are essential for business leaders in order to stay ahead of the competition and to drive growth as a business leader it is crucial to understand the importance of being forward thinking as it allows you to constantly adapt and evolve in an ever-changing marketplace. So with that in mind, Britta, we'll start with you. As a leader, what tactics have you developed and or implemented to drive growth? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so let me kind of contextualize it for a moment. So in the roles that I've had in corporate America, my roles haven't directly been responsible for driving growth in terms of being in a sales or marketing capacity. My roles have always been in supporting those who deliver growth, if you will. So if you think about my role at Pixar as an example, my role there was around creating a culture and a space and a place for all to thrive to ensure that we were telling our best stories. That's, an, that's a, a, a huge amount of responsibility and certainly very impactful. How does that drive growth? Well, broad audiences equals box offices, box office results equals growth, but it wasn't necessarily being directly responsible for it. So the way that I deploy that is to really be thoughtful around what are to kind of reverse engineer it, right? How do we get to the outcomes that we want and what role does my team and myself play in achieving that? So it's analysis and making an assessment to figure out what the pieces of the puzzle need to be. Did you feel a responsibility, even though you didn't directly impact growth because you weren't in sales and marketing, did you still feel a responsibility to have some accountability with your staff on how well projects performed and overall how the company grew and how did you do that? How did you manage? That? Absolutely. As I said earlier, anytime I've accepted a role, it's because of the opportunity to have some type of legacy impact. And so that to me is just as important as the box office. So uh, I'll look at a film like Soul, for example, which was Pixar's first, um, I would say culturally, well, 
culturally responsible film, or second culturally responsible film. So my, my role in that was to partner with the filmmakers. My role in that was to ensure that we were thoughtfully representing that character and the lived experiences of that character, which was the case throughout. So our accountability was not only to our, our studio, our storytellers, but also to the audience and ensuring that we were doing so in a thoughtful way. That's great. And Soul, love it. We watch it every Thanksgiving. Uh, me and my 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 young adult kids, they're not kids, but beautiful, beautiful film. Well, there you go. Love Thank that. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to Quincy. So what tactics have you developed and or implemented to drive growth? Um, I, you know, I guess... Um, really looking at your business as a team sport, right? Um, nothing happens without your team, right? Because it's a group of people coming together to achieve a common goal. So as a leader, I look at it that way and I approach it as I have to number one, select a great team, right? Your team has to be strong. Second, I provide whatever support I can to make their job as easy as possible so that they can focus on the tasks at hand. But I also would not ask my team to do anything I wouldn't do. So I show by example, I step in front when it's necessary and um, I give credit. You know, I'm a big a proponent of, you know, there's a lot of leaders, I think, that, you know, everything is about me. It's like, no, it's not. I understand that. I couldn't do this without you, right? So when credit's due, I give credit. So it's really just feeding and nurturing your group. Put aside the fact that you have to have, you know, good vision, have a good business plan, right? You have to good, you know, a strategy that takes you towards your goal. You know, like Britta said, you know, when you're releasing a movie, you have to have a P&L that shows you how you're going to track to profitability. And you have to work to achieve that, right? So those are things that are obvious. Everybody knows that we're in business school, right? But we're also, again, dealing with people, right? So you have to understand, listen to, talk to, um, you know, pour into um, people in the way that works best for them. I also believe that, you know, um, sometimes, you know, you ever talk, talk uh, people say, oh, this person's a star. Um, and you could have a group of sales folks and you have one person that is just phenomenal. They're just killing it, but they're toxic right? and they're cancerous, right? I am of the mindset. It's like, look, I would rather get rid of that person. I, I, I don't care if they're uh, an over earner or overachiever, if they're not bringing, if they're not being Kobe in the equation, if they're not being Jordan in the, like where everybody else gets better as a result of them. If it's just, I'm the, I'm the winner and everybody else and they're undermining and I don't like that. I don't want that in my team because I want everybody, because I think the aggregate performance of everyone is way powerful than the performance of one person, right? Because then you're getting a multiple of returns from your entire organization versus the one individual that gets to shine and you're still fighting to raise, you know, and you're firing people that aren't performing, but this person isn't helping, they're not assisting, right? So I create a mentorship scenario in my organization, however I, you know, but I also mentor. My door is open all the time. There's not a, there's not a conversation I won't have. I want to hear everybody's opinion, right? I, you know, and, and then my job is to be able to synthesize that, I believe, and then spit it back to the group in a way that might make sense to them, you know, based off of what I know and what my skill set is, and then have that tested and, and, and you know, I, I should say just test it again. What do you think about that? So it's it's very collaborative, in my opinion. I think if you if you treat it as a team sport, if you're supportive supportive of your team, if you nurture your team, and you also ride in front when necessary, but then fall back when necessary, then what you've done is you've created a culture of performance, and then provided because you can do all that and have a bad plan, right? And it does but you know all that you know the 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 obvious one is have a good plan first. But all of that is like, if you can have a great plan and have a terrible culture, and we've seen that, we're watching a little bit of that right now, right, in, in, in the industries. 
So um, that, that's, I guess that's the answer. That's just how I view it. It's like I approach it in a way that, look, this is a group of people coming together for something. And my job is to help them do that for me. I love the idea of creating a culture of performance. I know that innovation requires change. And, and in some scenarios, many scenarios, people don't like change. <laughs> so what have you done to help your staff, your team to stomach change? Yeah, I mean, but change is tough for everyone, right? But one thing that helps change uh, or helps a person adapt to change is getting them vested in the change. How is it, what does it mean for me? Like oftentimes we don't have, you know, the, the indoctrination, that's not indoctrination, that's, you know, I don't like the word, but the concept of it all. It's like, how do I get you involved? How do I get you vested in this vision? Right. And, and we don't have often, I think great leaders do it, but some some organizations don't. They just impose change. But change, you know, like we said, this is a team sport. This is a company. If people spend eight hours a day more than the time sometimes than they spend with their family at work. Right. So they're investing their life into this organization. Right. So it's personal to them. I get it. So why how why how does this change help you? How does this change benefit you? And if it doesn't, then it's my job to make sure that I ease that shift or that change the best as I can. And that's really just understanding that you're a human, you're a human being, man. You're a mom to someone, or you're a father to someone, you're a son to someone, or you're a daughter to someone, right? And understand that's who you're dealing with. So, uh, you know, address it and deal with it appropriately. You know, you, an organization doesn't, and you don't have to have this, you know, um, what we see, and sometimes it's taught in school, but you know, this, this approach to where look this is how it is and i'm cutting heads and all that stuff that you don't have to do that that's not the way you win that is a way that is a approach to people but there's many organizations that have a different culture and they're just as successful we just don't hear about them all the time love that love it love it love it create value around change love that mm -hmm. Okay, um, Philip, you're going to conclude this portion of our um, panel of our Q&A. So as a leader, what tactics have you developed and or implemented to drive growth? Everything that Quincy said, I concur with 100% because I worked, at, you know, typically as a regional or, or senior vice president of sales. Uh, everything he said, I agree with 100%. Um, but what I will add to it from a personal point of view would be that I'm always looking for innovative ways and tools to solve a problem. So for example, I wanted to figure out a way that I could shorten my day by getting to senior executives in major corporations uh, when LinkedIn was first being evolving as a tool that we could use. I figured out that if I could come up with a way that could deliver information to a senior executive within a corporation utilizing LinkedIn, even Twitter, YouTube, uh, by finding something that that leader had said, either in a newsprint or in a YouTube video, and attaching that and publishing that comment and associating and tagging them with it, and hashtagging it to the people that I thought that leader would want to see that information that he talked about. Don't ask him anything, but just point it. Make a general comment following up on that that said, this benefited an organization I had talking to and I had shared it with them. And this is a great piece of advice right here. Oftentimes that meant I didn't have to call his secretary or his executive assistant to get a, to touch him because I've used social media, a platform, in a way that was beneficial to him. I basically was an influencer of his content. And at the time that I started utilizing that, it was an early adoption. People thought that I, within the organization that I did that with, I won't name it, it's a very large company, they thought I was out of my mind when I first started doing it. But I started getting a lot of appointments. I got to go on calls where I'd bring one of my superiors with me and 
we'd ride all the way up to the 54th floor and I'd get an audience and he's like, how did you do that? And I use social media to do it. So uh, it is part of my uh, ability to get in front of the people that I needed to get in front of. I utilize techniques by learning new and innovative ways to reach out and touch people. And then everything else that Quincy said, the way he described it is exactly to the T. Yeah, you know, it's um, it takes a real, it takes a certain skill set to have people buy into a vision that is new, innovative, that they've never seen or done before. Most people fall into fear mode when it comes to something new. So what have you done to help investors or your team to see what you see, the end result, which may be years down the road, but they have to work towards it now? Well, I was the guy, you know, um, in corporate where seeing is believing. So I was, a, a my, my direct, contribution was always to revenue, hitting my goals, going on the president's trip at the end of the year, having my stock options uh, be executed, you know, through the entire my life cycle with that organization and was predicated on me achieving the stated goals of the organization for, for my revenue generation. And so I was the guy that they would say, you know, hey, guys, uh, we want you to hear Philip Shepard on the phone. When he got to know, when this person is saying, no, listen how he does it. Um, when I did my presentations, uh, back to, again, information is power. Uh, the way they bought into me is I could pick up your deck. You couldn't make the meeting. I could jump in a, in a car, go flipping through your deck, show up at your business meeting, and I could deliver your presentation with a whole bunch of people I only met in the car. And they, the people would be amazed, like, how did he do that? You know, um, so then it was like, well, tell us your methodology. And so part of that was sharing and being open, as, t as uh, Quincy said, building a team, um, being willing to step up and, and take the initiative and demonstrate the know-how. That's how I do it, you know, today as, a, as an entrepreneur is show people when I get in front of people and talk to them about some of my ideas that what I'm trying to do with my books, uh, they lean in. And and that's because of the preparation that I that I bring to the table and, and the initiative. So that's what I would add to that. That's great. Thank you so much. So at this time I'm I'm going to turn it over to Erica and Lauren who will um, take questions from the audience. Thank you, Karen. Hi, my name is Erica Corley. I am the president of the Grazia Dio Black Student Association. And this evening, we will be uh, taking your questions and answers. Um, I'm glad for those individuals who are able to put their questions into the chat. We will go ahead and get those questions answered by the panelists. And with that, I'll pass it over to Lakaya Williams. Hi, everyone. It's such a really great experience and learning from you all so far. Thank you for your time this evening. I am the VP of the BSA, and I'll be working with Erica to help with uh, some of the questions that we have for you guys tonight. Uh, I can start off. So one of the audience members had asked, what is the cost of being overly resilient? Have any of the speakers experienced that uh, experience burnout from being too resilient? Hi, I'll jump in on this one because um, I alluded to it before. I think that, you know, resilience has a tax, right? And I think that's what this question is getting to. And I think that being able to parse how you respond to whatever situation becomes really important relative to protecting your well being. If I give you a specific example, I'll go to the summer of racial reckoning. Um, you know, 2020, I think one of Philip or, or Quincy referenced it, you know, the George Floyd murder, um, DEI professionals all of a sudden went from the background to the foreground. And we found ourselves and I found myself, I had no, no bounce back left. I had given everything I could give. 
And I think that as black women in the workplace, I read a statistic some time ago that was saying that I think something like 80% of black women in the workplace, I think it was 88% or something of black women in the workplace acknowledge that they have experienced or are experiencing burnout. And I think that that's certainly a very telling statistic, but certainly something that I can attest to during that period of time, because I had poured out so much to everyone else that I had failed to re establish and re-pour back into myself. And so I think that, yes, burnout is absolutely the tax of over-resilience. And I think that's where, as I was referencing earlier, we really have to be intentional about how we respond and how much energy we put into that response. But 2020, by the fall, I was white, for sure. Thank you for that. Quincy, our yeah. friend. Yeah, I, I would um, add to that. I think what Britta said is is spot on. Um, uh, but other things is, you know, building your community, um, feeding into your family, right? Because you get energy and nurturing from those people. Um, and remember, you know, this is a, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, who, who all the LA folks are, but you know, this is a marathon, right? Um, you have to work. Like we work out for, you know, go to the gym to look good. Some of us, right? Go to the gym to build your muscles. But no, you work out for life, right? To create some, some sustainability for yourself, to be able to withstand. Because even your, you know, your physical being is being affected by stress and all of that. But if you, you know, work to um, focus on your health, you know, what you eat, going to the gym, releasing stress, right? That helps to support your ability to have a level of tolerance that is going to be required in the work environment because it's tough, right? We, you know, one thing is we have to also understand that this is not an easy road, right? By any means for anyone, regardless of what you look like, right? But there are certain people that have harder roads because of what they look like and because of possibly their gender or you know their their sexual orientation or whatever whatever it may be, that's the environment you're in. So you have to train for that, right? And that's how I, I look at. It. I tell my kids that all the time. Like, look, we have we have health as a way of life in my home. You know, I push everybody to it simply because I know that if you don't do that, your lifespan. I'm going off of other stuff, so I apologize. You know, is shortened, right? And it's compounded by the fact that you're out here working really hard. The other piece is knowing when to stop, right? You cannot, you know, if you aren't here, if you aren't health, I mean, if you aren't healthy, if you're not taking care of yourself, you, your vision, your goal that you have, you might, not, you might not get there, right? So you have to consider how you're taking care of yourself, right? And that's mandatory. It's part of the job. So I would say community, you know, family, and health is paramount for the ability to withstand and also stay resilient, but keep your levels lower so that you're never tapping yourself out um, over time. Thank you. And I would, yes, I was going to say, uh, I was going to add to that by saying, I agree that you have to know how to uh, take a step back. And if you're not sure how to go about that, there are resources out there. Um, a psychologist, uh, your family, um, and others that you need to reach out to. I know when I came off, what I wasn't prepared for when I came off the reality television show uh, was the sheer amount of interactions I was going to have with complete strangers about what I did when I was actually on the show. And it was so, I must have talked to probably, you know, 5,000 people in a, you know, a six month time frame. And initially you feel this sense that you want to, you know, ask, answer all their questions and, and, and feel like you, 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 you're obligated, if you will, at least that's how I felt. And others, you know, that had been in the show that I'd spoken to about it. Um, but I, I was fortunate that I had 
I knew who I was. I knew what I, I was an older person who had played and I knew that I needed to take a complete step back and, and talk to some people that could help me adjust to that quote, new reality. Never really, uh, I've always had the ability when I was, uh, you know, in the full-time corporate world working for a corporation, I always had that ability uh, to step back. I always engage in activities. Um, I, I work out, I play basketball, I roller skated, I lift weights. It's one of the reasons they recruited me, you know, to be on that, on the television show. I was 52 years old, but I still look like I was about 40 years old. Um, and I still maintain that today at 66 years old. You know, I, I work out every single day doing something. Um, and I think that's key. And I, and I meditate and I, and, and as a, as a person of advantage age today, even with the news, we are given so much information today that you're processing. And if you put a layer of your, you know, your activities and your work on top of that, it's a, it's just, it can be over overbearing. And so it's really important that you just take a step back and, and not take ownership of everything that's happening around you that you really don't have full control over. What you do have control over are how you respond and how you react. And I, um, and I think it's, you know, just paramount that you, you, you focus on, on yourself and your family and the people that you, you, you love and care about. Um, and you, and you set aside some time every single day to do that, to rebound. Thank you so much for all, for all of your great advice and information. Um, moving on to our next audience question. This is specific for Quincy. An audience member asks, um, are there specific books that you would recommend regarding the practice of mental toughness? Yes, I, I do have one. Um, one of my favorites. Um, I For me, it was life-changing. Um, it's called A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. And what it does is it discusses the idea that we have a subconscious um, mind thought process and that that subconscious thought process is not you. For example, coming on this Zoom, prior to coming on, someone may have had anxiety, right? Someone may have had um, some level of fear, a fear response in their body, right? Why? Because they were concerned or scared of what might happen. They have these visions and these thoughts about bombing and looking bad and all of that. You can do that like it happens when you go into an interview. But what that what's happening to you at that moment is your subconscious mind is just bringing up these thoughts that are not based in reality. They're a trauma response, right? So whatever your trauma, historical trauma that exists in you are is always going to come up in certain situations. The idea of um, self-affirmation, right? You know that when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you speak out loud, I am worthy. I am beautiful. You've seen, I've seen a little TikTok or with a little girl doing that, right? Super cute. But what that really means is you are verbalizing consciously speaking positivity into yourself, right? So think about this. If you're driving in the car, you're on your way to a, um, an interview, and the you're thinking your palms are sweating all that you're scared and nothing is happening you're just driving along you haven't even gotten there yet you're terrified well that is because you're thinking these unconscious thoughts these unconscious thoughts are popping up in your head if you were to just stop and say no i'm not i'm going to do well i'm then you bring it into reality you bring it into your consciousness and then you start to control how you think because your mind is very powerful you just a thought can make you feel something, right? Even though it may have never happened to you, you're scared or you're hurt or you're mad, right? You have this with dreams, right? You wake up mad at somebody, like not even happy. You have the power over that. We don't realize that. You have power over that. It has to be exercised though. Meaning whenever that happens to you, you speak positivity into yourself because then you take a conscious control of how your body and your mind is responding to a particular situation. So all of that I learned from that book, right? Because we all grow up with those things. You know, my daughter used to have 
fear of speaking in front of people. We walked through it. I had to read the book. And I was like, oh, wow, what an epiphany. Really? That thought I was having is not really, oh, so if I say, if I just tell myself to stop, I can then replace my thought with my own consciousness, right? That book, groundbreaking for me. Um, and the, the, it's, how it speaks to mental toughness is that it, it helps to teach you about your mental <laughs> first, right? So that you understand how your mental is working. So that way, when you start to exercise your mental toughness, you know how to do it. And mental toughness is making sure that you have the control over your own mind and how you think. Thank you, Quincy. Really great response. I wrote that one down. I'm an avid reader. Um, our next question from an audience from the audience indicated you've all you've all been you've all indicated that you've had mentors. How does one seek a professional mentor or an advisor to help you move forward in your career? I'll take that one on uh, first. Uh, early on, when I uh, get on with a with an organization or a new company, I try to identify people who are positive, who are knowledgeable about the organization, who uh, in my role in sales, for example, um, oftentimes it'd be some senior executive who'd been with the firm for a number of years, uh, had shown some interest in my uh, me as a new employee with that organization and had indicated that if I needed any help or if there's any way that I could uh, use their assistance, uh, please ask. So that would be oftentimes uh, one way that I would, you know, identify someone within the company. Other times I would uh, volunteer uh, my own help to someone that was junior to myself in an organization, very similar to someone that helped me. And they would, you know, write an email that went to a number of different individuals within the company. And I got on someone's radar and I would then be approached that way. So there's a number of different ways that, you know, you can, you can identify a mentor, but typically uh, for myself, it was, you know, looking for someone that could help me do what I needed to do to be successful, you know, within that company. And oftentimes um, that person could, you know, end up being a, a lifelong uh, business associate as well as uh, a friend. And, and that's what, I've been fortunate to have with the number of people that I've had the opportunity to identify as mentors. Perfect. Um, any thoughts on that from Quincy or Britta? Yeah, I'll chime in quickly. I think um, I think it's important to I think it's important to tap into professional associations as well as people within your organization. Um, for me, my mentors have come both within the organization and have been a roles as Philip described, you know, people who were committed to my success. But I've also had mentors who have been outside of the organization that I've actively sought because they had a depth of knowledge in the industry, in a, a complementary industry, and would help me to extend and expand my learning. So it's really being curious and asking questions, be willing to, you know, to acknowledge what you don't know, and be willing to step outside of, of your, your organization. Yeah, um, I would add that um, open yourself to the idea that mentorship is around you all the time, right? It's just taking different forms. Um, this panel is a mentorship scenario, right? You're receiving mentorship from folks. So, you know, approaching it that way, um, you're to be standing in line at, a, at a, uh, a, at a coffee shop and you might receive mentorship in line, right? So I think mentorship takes on different forms and when you open yourself to receiving mentorship in your daily activity, in your daily life, then you'll open yourself to information and opportunities that you might not otherwise have allowed to come into your space, right? And some of that could be simply, you know, if I'm standing in a coffee line and I see this gentleman standing behind me or this woman um, standing in front of me, and um, there's, you know, there's something interesting, I'd spark a conversation. 
you know, hey, how are you doing today? And whatever. And sometimes you find you, you, you receive some valuable <laughs> nuggets from just that small, short interaction that if you didn't just open yourself up for that, that you wouldn't have received. So, you know, a lot of folks, I believe that when they think of mentorship, they're like, okay, I find this one person, this one person is going to be with me and mentor me for this period of time. Uh, it may not look like that, right? So I think open yourself to different ways that mentorship can exist uh, for you. And it doesn't have to be continuous and ongoing. It could just be for a moment. Perfect. Thank you all for your answers. Um, this will actually be our last question of the evening of the Q&A session. Um, and this question is actually an overall question from um, the BSA. Uh, it would be, um, how do you navigate challenges in your professional landscape while staying true to your authentic self as a person of color? We want to go ahead and ask this question of every one of the panelists. We would love to get your perspective. First of all, you are beautiful, you are worthy. <clears throat> um, that's the first step, right? And um, some environments were not built with you in mind and accept that, understand it, and then go change it. Um, the world is um, constantly telling you what you aren't that means you have to work overtime to tell yourself what you are. Yeah, I would double click on what I said earlier. You don't have to consume everything that's served to you and know that you have value, you have a vision, you have a voice and bring that in every day in whatever environment you're in. And I would add that you are loved. God did, God put you on this planet for a reason, tap into that, believe it, take ownership of it, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Thank you so very much for your answers. They're very inspirational and we will take them to heart. And with that, we'll pass it back over to Karen to close us out. Thank you so much. What I'd like to do is thank Lauren, Lakaya, Erica, the Black History Month committee members, all of the BSA members. Thank you so much to our panelists. Just excellent um, job. Thank you for your time and for the information, the invaluable information that you've shared this evening. And thank you to our audience for attending this event. I'm grateful to have been able to moderate this event. I learned so much. And I really am grateful for this opportunity. I hope you took away some information that you can apply to your personal and professional lives. And this concludes our conversation um, this evening. So thank you.